Hey. I'm Anfa, welcome to another Liblast update video. Things have been happening. Um, yeah, I made a procedural muzzle flash, which I'm kind of testing right now. I'm working on a weapon system so that, well, we can have weapons and start actually have the shooter part of the shooter working, because right now we have movement. Uh, we have a basic level. Uh, but we don't have shooting yet. We have networking. Um, yeah, this isn't a game yet, because we need shooting. What good is a shooter without shooting? Also, if you press V... Yeah, the camera <laughs> is not, not super figured out yet. Um, I'm working on f figuring out how to um, how to parent the camera to the head of the skeleton because, as you can see, the skeleton's head is like moving back and forth. So I think it would be good to have the camera follow that. Um, I think it's pretty cool to have this third-person model be part of our first-person experience, but I think it's uh, unfortunately not going to work. Um, there's a good reason why pretty much all FPS games have a separate thing they render for the first-person view rather than the third-person view, and these don't align perfectly ever, because that just doesn't give good results. Um, that's why it's what it is now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's working. I'm going to close the game and show you how the model flash works. Also close this one as well. So we have some frames per second to work with. All right, so what is here? I'm going to show you how this looks. Is our muzzle flash and we animate it like this. So we go from 0 to 1, and that creates our animation. Now, everything inside is... So this is made out of planes. As you can see, I have one plane with three more planes. I'm going to just hide everything and just show you one by one. Maybe I'm going to undo it to not... Um... Yeah, let's move the animation progress here. It's a nice, nice, bright piece. So we have a main we have a flame. This is nothing but just a plane mesh. Or rather a... Uh, A quad mesh, so two triangles, and it's using a custom shader. The custom shader is here, and what the custom shader does is um, take it takes a circle, which is a two D gradient, so a procedural texture made in Godot. Just you know, uh, we can alter this, and you can see the results. Oh man, that looks even better. Oh. Maybe I'm going to keep it like that. Yeah, that looks sweet. Oh, we can also make it... tiny. Interesting. There was a necessity for... I'm inverting. There was a necessity for this texture to 
Oh no, that was a different texture. Okay, okay, no problem. I'm gonna keep it like that, it looks better. Mm. So we have our circle. Our circle is um, displaced by noise textures. I'm gonna try and make this. So we have a noise texture that's just scrolling and another noise texture that is scrolling. These two combined give us um, red and green scrolling. Uh, what is what this is uh, used for is just oh wait could I just invert one of the axes and have them like scroll out of no that would be so good wow never mind so the thing is i can't generate a color color noise so i'm generating one noise i'm using the same generated noise here texture just offset by a certain amount so they create a 2d vector field and this vector field is then used to offset the coordinates so Mm -hmm. Oh, now we're just remapping them. Here are standard UV coordinates, so X is red from 0 to 1, and green is Y from 0 to 1. So this is, yeah, it's like, it's like that. So we take that. <laughs> then I this was supposed to be an offset, but I'm actually not using that. I can even simplify this. Now I'm splitting it into two pieces because I want to um, process each piece separately. So I'm gonna I'm taking the X component and I am first multiplying it by three and then clamping it from one to three from 1 to 2. And what that does is, if I map this to my circle, I'm going to see that. If I just pass the X coordinate unaffected, we have this. If I pass the Y coordinate unaffected, we get this. So the Y coordinate goes through the eight arctangent function and that function allows me to squish it squish it to achieve this you know kind of directional shape I'm gonna undo to get the original value because everything else is tuned you know perfectly specifically for this and Wait, I'm doing this to the Y function. Yes, Y. So X. Now X. I'm multiplying by three, which creates three copies. Then I'm clamping between one and two, which leaves me with the middle copy. So discarding left and right. Now, after that, I'm again using some clamping but I'm also using an expression that actually is not used. I can delete that, this as well. So what I'm doing next is I am just trying to stretch this a little bit. And what happens after that is we add the noise, which is scrolling. And our noise is just, you know, adding random changes to X and Y components of the UV map. So if you look at just the UV coordinates, you can see that they're distorted. This is exactly what we want. After that, I'm applying a power function, which affects the, the gradient of this thing. And here is like, um, I think I multiply it by the noise. And after that, there's also multiplication by a curve. 
And this curve is the animation progress. So now if I affect the animation progress, fortunately, um, can I do it without like losing focus of this? Maybe I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Give me instance shader. Yes. So animation progress. You can see animation progress makes this curve evaluate and multiply. And I'm remapping this to so this actually isn't so short, but yeah. That means I can fade out the flame with the animation progress, which is exactly what I want. There we have some addition, which we don't use. After that, I do another curve, and this curve is made to, um, this curve is meant to produce this effect of the flame, like starting here and moving outwards. So it's, it's not just, you know, growing in place, but it's also like starting here and then moving outwards. And, um, if I combine both, you can see that we have flame is like fading in. Oh. <laughs> okay. And we have this gradient scrolling through it that gives us this effect of the flame starting in a certain place and then f flying outwards and fading out. After that, we apply a smooth step which is just, you know, helping us round off the values and make this a little bit a little bit smoother looking, less like contrasting and stuff. We're kind of constraining it to zero to one. Um, for, for this is like a bit, yeah. Um, this is probably like, you know, applying contrasts a bit. And then after that, we, what do we do? Uh, we combine this into a vector. And so we have just a, um, the X channel. So red, green, blue, red is X. And after that, we use it to sample a gradient. And this gives us our flame. So this is pretty much how the flame is drawn. You see, it's fully, it's fully procedural. There is nothing like, you know, no texture files that aren't created by Godot in at runtime. Um, and it's, it's all a shader. And the benefit of that is that it's also different, you know, because the time, I'm using time input here to drive the offsets of the texture. So at every shot, this is different, which is nice. And I also can customize it with, you know, instance per shader, <laughs> instance shader parameters. I can make it so every single flame is a bit different. And that is what I'm doing. In fact, if I make these two now in sync, go 0 0.5. Yep. So these two have a different time offset. Uh, one has a time offset of zero and another has a time offset of also zero. Okay. That's not what I want. But if I make a time offset of 0 0.2, then they are not identical and they look a bit more natural. Another little effect I'm doing, which is now disabled, is you see there is this um, edge case where you look at it from a side and the horizontal plane is like at an angle and you see like, oh, it's a plane and that doesn't look very good. So I'm using a Fernell. Okay, that's not very um, mm, that's gonna be better okay so I'm, I'm making this additive but you can see that if i have a certain angle the plane disappears and here i multiply the flame with that so the idea is that in this moment where the plane would be really clearly you know just here it 
it's fading out so to mitigate this effect it also means that if it's like you're looking at it point blank you won't see anything but well at this point you probably should have something else to look at as well and of course the ideal would be to also have a circular um plane in here that would instead of scrolling like you know horizontally like have a, the plane scrolling outwards so in a radial fashion and maybe i'm going to do that at some point but now it's not necessary well after that i just add a bunch of extra small flames which are aligned to the model of the muzzle if i show height gizmos you can see the gun's muzzle has these four holes which are supposed to give this squashed x pattern which i think looks nice and with the animation progress it all looks like this yep and my script the script that handles all of that is i think is pretty sweet so I'm um, first at startup. Um, I'm finding all the meshes that are children of the muzzle flash. It's this function here. So I'm calling it on the node itself, and then I'm getting all the children, which is all the direct children. So I'm gonna get all of these nodes. Check if the if the node is a mesh instance three D. So the light is not. Is, the light is skipped. These are added. So I add all the mesh instances to a list or an array. And after that, if the node I just checked also has any nodes underneath it, I call find meshes on all of these. Or rather, I call find meshes on that node as well. So the script goes like that, goes through the first level, discards the OmniLight because it's not a mesh instance 3D, adds these, then or like adds the first one, then it checks if it has any children, it does, so it calls find meshes on this one, the, the new re recurrent instance of find meshes function. Instance invocation. Finds all of these, adds them to the list as well, S checks that none of them have any children, so it terminates and we like return to the upper level. And this circle repeats. What we end up with is a is an array of mesh instance 3D, and all of them use the same shader parameter shader and have the same same shader parameters. So I can easily animate them. Now, how do I animate them? I'm using a tween. I have a top level tween defined here, and that is so that a subsequent triggering of the flash function will not create tweens that are fighting between each other. Because with tweens, uh, there's a problem that if you just create a tween ad hoc, like go, you know, create tween. If I, if I did this and had a unique tween per each flash function invocation, then it's easy to create a situation where a tween is existing and it is changing these properties, but I but this is called again before this first tween finishes. And now we have two tweens touching the same data and fighting each other. And that would create... Mm, it would be a bit of an undefined behavior. It certainly wouldn't animate properly. That's why I'm using a single tween, which also is more conservative on the resources. And first, I'm checking if, if it exists, if, if the, actually it's, it's been created, because for starters, it's not nothing, it's null. Then I check if, if it exists as a tween. Well, uh, is it running an animation? Because it, it could be a tween that is expired, so no need to do anything about it. Uh, if it is running, that means we would create an overlapping animation and we kill the tween to make sure that all of the tweeners that are created inside are also terminated so they no longer touch these properties on our, on our script. So this is like this little intro to make sure we don't mess up. After that, we create a new tween because we've cleaned up any possible previous tween. We showed this the whole thing because 
in the ready function, I hide the whole flash. And that's because, well, why should we render these meshes if, if they are actually not visible? Because as long as their um, animation progress is at zero, they won't draw anything, right? So there is really no point in um, having them being processed by the rendering engine at all or just creating overdraw for no good reason. And there is more of it, of course. Yeah. For some reason, it's calling back faces, even though this uh, shader does not call back faces. But I guess the overdraw is, works by replacing the materials. Uh, the sh draw, display overdraw function, like feature, replaces the, the shader in the materials. So it doesn't respect the not calling yeah so like why have our rasterizer go through all of this if, if it's not going to result in any change in the frame so i just hide it to you know re reduce the the load of the on the graphics card uh so this is hidden i reset the animation progress to zero and then if something calls flash we do our animation we create a tween that interpolates the animation progress variable this one it makes it zero at start it interpolates it to one and it does that over a specific number of seconds which is 0.1 seconds in default but i in, in the configuration this configuration i shortened it to 0 0.5 so even shorter because 0 .0, 0 0.05 so five five hundredth the one one tenth was too long. So we interpolate that, and after that, I call tween the chain, which means the next tweener. Tweener is an object that belongs to the tween, which is instanced with this uh, call, and the tweener is just you know carrying on these tasks that we said that we tell him to. So after this one ends, this one will turn the flash turn the muzzle flash invisible again so it's going to interpolate the visible property to false over zero seconds so instantly after that we play the tween and that's all we have to do in our flash a coincidence of this playing is that our omni light is also visible only for 0 0.05 seconds which looks nice i thought about animating the the color and the energy for just the color to match the gradient that our uh, muzzle flash shader is using. So basically this one, but it turns out it's not really needed for a good effect and it would make things more complex. So I'm skipping that for now. Okay, but now how does interpolating this actually affect all the meshes? Uh -huh. This is the smart part, I think. Actually, I can delete that. And the smart thing is, in my animation progress variable, I define a setter. A setter is a method or a function that is called every time something tries to change the value of this variable. So every, every time something tries to change the value, this code is, is executed. So first thing, we need to actually execute the change because by creating a setter, we remove the automatic, automatic like, Let's say we override the default setter, which is just this. Just assign the new value to the, to the variable. So if we didn't do this, the animation value would actually never change. Even though our animation would work because the value we pass is still this. So I'm not sure about how our tween would react to this ne never changing. Uh, yeah, it would be bad. Don't forget to do this <laughs> if you're doing. So then, for all instances, which is, we know it's a mesh instance free, actually we have a static type array so that if we even try to add something that isn't a mesh instance 3D, it's going to error out on the compilation stage. Or the compilation stage. It's going to error out so we, like, we're not going to run into problems here as long as we don't add a mesh that has a different... Um, I mean, then it would just not work. This isn't going to, like crash or do a, it's gonna just throw a runtime error runtime error and nothing's gonna change if we have a mesh instance that doesn't have this shader that we 
expect. And then for every single instance, which is every single mesh instance here, we change the animation progress value of the instance shader parameter, animation progress, change it to the value that we have been updated. So our tween, our tween is updating this variable, which in its in in turn is updating all of our mesh instances shader parameters. And that results in animation, as you've seen. And that's how the muzzle flash works. I hope that was interesting, maybe inspiring. Um, if you want to check out the files and play with this yourself, I'm going to link the commit in which this is added. Um, yeah, and this is Liblast, a project to create a free and open source FPS multiplayer game with the entire workflow and toolchain being also open source uh, with all the media asset files, asset source files available as well so that everybody can just jump in and contribute or just learn from our work. If you want to learn more, go to liblat.st and you'll find links to our Codeberg, which is where we have all of our Git stuff, as well as our um, Mastodon account where we post updates and YouTube, where we post videos like this one as well. That's all for now. See ya.